Good evening and welcome everyone to our annual Comanche's Bite Fellowship presentation. Um, these are really two of the best nights of the year because we get to hear about um, all of the incredibly cool things um, that have been going on for students over the summer. Some of our, our best and, and brightest and most dynamic students from a variety of majors at Washington College. Um, some folks whom I and my colleagues at the Star Center already know well, other folks whom we're um, getting to um, meet um, and get to know well for the first time after um, having been hearing about their work long distance all summer through the Comages Byte program. I think most of you are familiar um, at this point with the Comages Byte program, but um, I see a couple of new faces out, out here, so I'll just talk about it briefly. Um, these fellowships uh, every summer send as many as a dozen students to leading cultural institutions around the country and occasionally even overseas. Um, the fellowship stipend pays for these students to cover their living expenses um, for, the, for the summer so that they're able to take jobs that ordinarily would be unpaid. Um, and the other thing that the Star Center does is we work closely with each of these institutions to match up students um, with the people who are going to be their supervisors and mentors and with the projects that they're going to be working on each summer. So what we basically do is we talk to folks at the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, some of the places you'll be hearing from tonight, and um, we say to them, okay, if we could get you a kick-ass Washington College student, of course, all Washington College students are by definition kick-ass Washington College students, that's a little redundant, but we say if we could get you just an awesome, fantastic Washington College student for the summer, um, would you guarantee to hold a place um, for that student? And we'll work with you to find somebody who really complements the work that you're, um, that you're doing for the summer. And so every year we, we do that. And this year we had, I think, um, as, as strong a team of student fellows as we've, as we've ever had before. Um, I have to um, especially say a few words of, of thanks. Um, first of all, a word of, of thanks and congratulations to um, the students as a, as a group. Um, not only because you are an, an awesome group who did great work this summer that we already know about from your final reports and from being in touch with you over the summer, and we'll hear more about that shortly, but also because um, you really did something this year that in the whole history of the Comages Byte program um, we'd never done before, which is that there was really uh, the creation of an online community via the Star Center's Facebook page, especially, where every week our Comages Byte fellows scattered far and wide, shared the work that they were doing in posts on Facebook, got in conversations with each other, got in, into conversations with other members of the Washington College community, Chestertown community, beyond, um, with faculty, really, really engaged, um, and there was a sense of kind of kind of esprit de corps, I think, this, this year in a conversation going on across the, um, the miles that uh, hadn't happened before. And I know that it was a lot of work um, for, you, for you guys to, to do on top of your responsibilities, um, and it just seemed to really be worthwhile and exciting and has inspired us to try to find more ways for next summer to try to build that sense of community among the fellows so it's not just a sort of a group of disparate people going off and doing their disparate experiences. So thanks um, to all of you for that. Um, thanks as well, especially to um, my colleague, Jean Wertman, who's here, whom um, many of you know by, by email, the students if not, if not otherwise, and who worked incredibly hard to just keep everything um, going, keep the, keep the, the the money coming, um, keep coordinating um, with 12 different students working at 12 far-flung institutions for the summer. Thank you so much, Jean, for all of your efforts and hard work. <laughs> as well as leading, leading the way on the social media efforts on um, co-producing a film about the Comages Bite experiences that's in the final editing stages right now. We're rushing to get it done in time for the Oscar documentary deadline. Um, but no, seriously, it's really, really great. And um, really just about all of our, of our fellows, um, except for, uh, for Aaron in, in Atlanta, were interviewed um, by our camera crew this summer and um, had, some great things to, had some great things to say. So thanks for that. Thanks as well to our faculty 
um, mentors, faculty sponsors who are here. I don't want to miss anybody, but I see Professor Black, I see Dr. Sorrentino, I see Professor Castro, I see Professor Durso, uh, I see Professor Lang. Um, am, am I missing any faculty here? Okay, that's all the faculty I see, but we've um, gotten just wonderful um, support and help and sponsorship and mentorship from a wide range of faculty, from a wide range of uh, departments, as you'll hear. And um, we're very grateful for, to all of you. Um, and, oh, and uh, Dr. Ka is that Dr. Calloway? No, it's not. Um, but uh, uh, there is Dr. Benz, however, former Kamachi Spite recipient. Welcome, Dr. Benz. Um, and uh, a big thank you as well to all of those who supported this program with your generous gifts. Um, we, every year, um, have to sort of go out and pound the pavement and raise money for these students to, um, to get these fellowships. Every cent that we raise in our fundraising goes directly to keep roofs over these students' heads and Chef Boyardee on their tables. Um, may, hopefully you ate a, something other than Chef Boyardee or ramen noodles during the summer a little bit. But uh, seriously, seriously though, the, the generosity of these, um, of these donors makes it possible for these students to have really, in many cases, um, life-changing experiences that they otherwise simply would not be able to, to have. Um, and we're just deeply, deeply grateful for that. This is a program that really takes the things that are going on um, for students at Washington College in the classroom um, and lets them be extended outside into, I, I hate that term, the real world, um, because it suggests that what goes on here isn't real and it's, it's very, very real, but certainly lets them um, take their college experience and extend it beyond campus, extend it into um, the rest of their, of their lives, into the rest of their, their careers. And, um, so thank you to our generous donors, especially here with us this evening are Mickey and Margie Ellsberg, who through the Ellsberg Family Foundation support this very generously. Thank you. I'm sorry I had to call you guys out. You know, I'll miss no occasion to embarrass you, so. I won't talk about your gold medals, though. <laughs> um, but I just did, sorry. <laughs> and um, finally, I just want to I just want to mention that um, for those of you who are here who are students who have not received Kamaji's Bite fellowships, we enthusiastically invite you to apply for them for next year. It's a competitive process, um, but we also are. It seems like the past few years able to keep raising a little bit more money each year, and so able to um, send more and more of our students out. I don't want to set a, a high bar for us for next year, but um, we certainly do our very best to um, sponsor as many Washington College students as we can each year at a range of these uh, institutions. By the way, if any of you have um, rich grandparents or friends or neighbors or somebody who might wanna get involved in sponsoring these, these fellowships, um, again, we really find that, uh, that every year we're just able to, um, to uh, place just as many students as we can find funding for, and, um, and that's been great. So if you're interested, there's material on the table back there um, next to Dr. Benz, that sort of round table with the, with the tablecloth. You can also talk to um, Gene Wortman or to me or other colleagues or our um, current and former Kamaji Spite fellows who can tell you all about the program. So, um, okay, well, we're gonna hear um, just very briefly um, from each of our six Kamaji's Bite Fellowship recipients. One of them, Robbie Teal, we're going to hear from um, remotely, but the others are actually here in the flesh, or maybe just convincing holographic projections of them. I don't know, very well done. Anyway, um, I'm just gonna um, introduce our first presenter, and then um, I'm gonna leave a list up here so that instead of popping back up and forth onto stage, I can, um, each of you will introduce the next person. So our first presenter, is Amanda Beck, a recent graduate of the class of 2015. Um, she is an art history major, a Hispanic studies minor, and as you will hear, this is expertise that fed directly into the work that she did this summer with Eleanor Harvey, who is a parent of a member of the class of 2018, incidentally, at the um, Smithsonian American Art Museum. And she's from Ellicott City, Maryland. And please welcome Amanda Beck. So 
my summer was spent at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And um, what I found is that when most people think of the Smithsonian is they think of what's on the National Mall. They think of the Natural History Museum. But really, the Smithsonian has so much more to offer. And I was lucky enough to be placed at the American Art Museum, which is really in the same building as the National Portrait Gallery as well. So for anyone who doesn't really know where it is or what the American Art Museum looks like, it's right kind of by the Verizon Center. Um, just a, flew, a few short blocks away from the White House, the Mall, um, really the Capitol, the National Monument, everything. So it's in the most wonderful place that you could ever imagine to have um, spent in a, a summer internship. My summer project, um, I was working with senior curator Eleanor Harvey, who uh, works at the, American, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Basically, I was her research assistant. And what was wonderful about this is that I was able to utilize kind of every skill that WAC implements and all the professors really stress. I was able to do original work, in-depth research, and to work creatively at the same time to produce research that has, had really never been done before. What I was researching specifically was a man named Alexander von Humboldt, who we really don't know anything about in the modern canon. The modern academic canon does not even hardly recognize him whatsoever, unless you're like, you know, like a Darwin specialist or something, which if you are, that's really cool. But um, this guy in particular, um, he was an Austrian botanist, he was an explorer, he was an artist, he was an abolitionist, but we don't know this anymore because he's been completely forgotten. And so what Eleanor Harvey is working on doing is building an exhibition from the ground up to kind of reintroduce this man into the canon, reintroduce him to the public that knows nothing about him, and kind of present him as a character who highly influenced American culture and American identity in the mid to late 18th, 19th century. So in my research, um, I was very surprised, but pleasantly surprised, to find that my Hispanic studies minor kind of just fit its way in naturally into my research. Um, turns out that Alexander von Humboldt, the man that I was researching, had an immense impact on an artist that we all kind of might be familiar with, Frederick Edwin Church. And Edwin, Frederick Edwin Church traveled all through South and Central and South America, kind of exploring all of these incredible landscapes and then painting them. I have an example right there on the right, close in on his um, study of Cotopaxi. And um, men like Frederick Edwin Church and a ton of 19th century other artists were just utterly obsessed with this Humboldt character. And because Humboldt was an incredible botanist, these artists were inspired to then take a close look at plants that they might not have ever otherwise had done. It also turns out that Humboldt had an immense impact on the American abolitionist movement. And kind of no one had any idea of this. Eleanor Harvey had an inkling that maybe he had, because he had popped up in a little bit of writings here and there. But it turns out that he was the, was the reason that um, Frederick Douglass was even introduced to abolitionism, really like before he wrote his book, everything. He turned to men like Humboldt, who were way ahead of, way ahead of the American 19th century abolitionist movement, who in Europe had had these writings for years and years and years supporting the abolitionist movement before the American one had ever come into fully come into development. And oh, I don't want to do that. Um, so it was a really, really great experience and a really great surprise kind of being introduced to this man and then going through all of these original documents, these primary sources, going over to the Library of Congress, going into the Smithsonian American Art Museum's personal library and looking through, sifting through all of these folders and what was kind of Trivial, seemed like trivial work at time, really was just a way for me to put into, you know, really implement the skills that I had been taught in a way that I didn't think that I would be able to in the real world. Um, and it was truly a wonderful experience. I was able to meet people that I never would have otherwise. The Smithsonian American Art Museum is truly a wonderful place, and I don't think it gets the credit that it really deserves. Um, and really, um, working as a research assistant kind of opened up my eyes to the multiple facets that being a curator really entails. And so it's not sitting behind a desk all day and, you know, just, and just writing or researching. It's thinking about how you do exhibit design. It's thinking about how am I going to present this to people who have no idea about this man and how do I make it interesting to a, a general public that includes so many different kinds of people who have interests, who have different backgrounds, and everything you can think of. So this was a really practical experience for me and I'm so, so glad that I had the opportunity to be a Come Juice Bite intern because it furthered my knowledge, my work experience in ways that I never would have been able to do otherwise.
That's it. Okay. Sure. Are there any questions? Sure. Uh, the Museum of American, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art is far and away my favorite part of the Smithsonian, probably my favorite, definitely my favorite Washington art museum. Uh, um, yeah. Was there one detail about the Humboldt's life that you discovered that just was especially, you know, um, gosh, there was so, there really was so much stuff. He, Humboldt was traveling from South America and he was going back to um, England, but he decided on a last minute whim to stop by DC and to meet Thomas, Je Thomas Jefferson for the first time. And he did, and it turns out that Thomas Jefferson had such an obsession with him that this great man, this great explorer who knew all about Central and South America, that him they created a, a relationship that lasted for years and years and years. And so he had this massive impact on our presidents that we, you know, we revere them so much. We don't know how much they actually looked to, you know, European counterparts who they then took to do the Louisiana Purchase and all this stuff that came to influence American identity and American expansionism, which for good or for worse, this man had such a massive impact. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I'm curious, since it's an art museum, um, what kind of painting besides the um, church, the Frederick Church, which I assume is the mm -hmm. last in the South and mm -hmm. the There were a lot, of, a lot of men and artists that, um, like at least who were directly artists that were impacted. Church, um, Catlin, um, George Catlin, he did a lot of Native American paintings. Um, but in addition to that, we're trying to make it more of not just a painting on the wall exhibition. We're trying to kind of make it a more well-rounded thing. Um, for example, the abolitionist movement you, um, used details, detailed maps to kind of show how the slave states were encompassing the free states. And it was these, they looked towards Humboldt's detailed mapping that he did of the United States and into Texas to be inspired to then make these maps that they used for their own cause. And so he kind of had these fingerprints that he left everywhere. He also was really close with the three main founders of the Smithsonian. Um, so it just turns out that he had all these connections everywhere. And so we're trying to make it a well-rounded exhibition rather than just a you know, stereotypical painting on the wall exhibition. Yeah. yeah. How did I get? No, um, actually, it's a, it's just kind of a same application that we all fill out, and then you can, you know, list your preferences of where you'd like to be based on your own expertise, and um, it just how hap. Well, my first place, actually, my first um, wanting to be placed was at the Portrait Gallery, and then I was subsequently placed at the American Art Museum, and it just turned out that that was a much better placement for me. And so I think that the Star Center works really, really well with you um, individually, so you can be placed in the best place for you. Yeah. Okay. Up next is Holly. Okay, I will do a, a quick intro of Holly, <laughs> um, since it's awkward to introduce yourself. Holly Chisholm is a, uh, is a double major in history and business management. Um, she's from Jackson, New Jersey, and she worked at the National Archives and Records Administration. So. Uh, as he said, uh, I'm Holly Chisholm, and I worked at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. this summer. Um, so I worked with the Education and Public Programs Division, uh, specifically as the social media intern. They had about 12 interns, give or take, this summer uh, for the education department, but I was the social media intern, so while we all kind of took turns staffing the hands-on activity center in the museum, I did a lot of the things that worked with the events and um, the different social media channels and blogs that they run. Um, I did uh, a lot of live tweeting on the events. So I would go to each of the education events and then they gave me the password so I could hook them up onto my phone and I would go and then just live tweet. And then afterwards I would uh, write a summary for Facebook and Instagram that would be posted later. 
Um, I also worked with the education um, blogs. The biggest one was the education updates, and they gave me a blog summer series so I could go online and go through the National Archives catalog and more specifically the um, docsteach.org, which is the National Archives online teaching with documents tool. And so then I could pick whatever document I was interested in. I could write a little short post about it. And actually, I wrote too many of them, so they're still being posted until probably the end of November. Um, and so then the other blog that I worked on was for the Tumblr for the year-long exhibition in the Lawrence O'Brien Gallery. Uh, this year it is the Spirited Republic, Alcohol in America. So I uploaded over 100 documents and pictures on alcohol. So now it is completely running until the end of January when the exhibit's taken down. Um, but my favorite event that I did was the Primarily Teaching uh, workshop. The interns joked and called it Primarily Eating because it was a catered event. We all got free food out of it. But it is a teacher workshop that focuses on bringing the primary sources to the classroom. So the teachers would come in and they would get a box of documents that had been pre-sorted out. And DC's topic was Chinese immigration. So each uh, teacher would go through the boxes and pick out a couple documents that they found were really interesting or they wanted to use for uh, lesson planning that they were going to be doing throughout the week. And then the, uh, they would scan the documents in the special innovations hub that Washington, D.C. Uh, actually opened specifically for primarily teaching. So I kind of like live tweeted the opening of the innovation hub that they have there for the researchers. Um, so then after that, the archive staff would then upload it to Docs Teach. And so we uploaded over 300 pages of documents that have not been online before. And most of them hadn't been open for a good 100 years before we actually went through and picked out the documents. Um, part of my job on the blogs was also to write about the ones that were happening around the country. So there were five total in the summer. But for the DC uh, workshop, I also uh, live tweeted the whole week and then um, interviewed each of the teachers for advertising purposes. So currently on the Facebook page every Thursday, each teacher gets a spotlight and some of the quotes from my interviews are up every week and that should be going to November as well. Um, so overall, uh, my experience at the National Archives was an amazing adventure. Um, I think I have a better appreciation for primary sources now, because not only because I spent every single day in the same building as the Declaration of Independence, but um, every project that we worked on at the National Archives had to be really directly back to the holdings of the National Archives, or at least something that they would do, or why the institution is what it is. So everything that we worked on was very heavily laid upon the primary sources. Um, also for social media, I learned a lot more about writing for different audiences and how long to make each thing and how short and to cut things down. So I've definitely grown more comfortable with how I write as well as what I write. And then of course, spending an entire summer in Washington DC was a pretty great experience. Um, I made a lot of friends with the interns that were uh, working with me at the National Archives. And then I spent the uh, 4th of July in DC, which is definitely an experience, and crowded and muddy, but still an experience, really nice. And um, overall, it was just really great to be a tourist for the entire summer, and I felt like I did a lot of things. But uh, it's definitely a highlight of my college experience, and in and of itself, I already miss DC, so that is all I have, so thank you. Yeah, there's uh, College Park, Maryland has um, the different posters and films and non-text documents, but the one directly in Washington, D.C., like right off the mall is the one that I was at, and they have mostly just text documents in like one reading room, so most of the researchers go to College Park, but... Um, I think probably the calling card that John Wilkes Booth sent to Vice President Andrew Johnson the day that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. So he sent it to his hotel and it says, like, are you home or are you available or something like that? But then he left and then hours later, President Lincoln was shot. So, yes, that was my favorite one that I found. 
Um, well, that one, it was online, so if, I mean, I guess, I'm not sure when it was posted, but, yeah. Anything else? Um, we did take a tour of College Park, Maryland. They wouldn't let us in the stack room because they have some really high-tech laser security. But we could look through the window. And then at the end of the primarily teaching week, uh, my one supervisor brought everyone up into the Center for Legislative Archives on the seventh floor. That was like the, the most of the documents that I got to see. So they had um, some letters from Daniel Boone, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and the radar map from Pearl Harbor. So those were the ones that they were showing then. But that was the closest I got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the education program uh, puts on a sleepover twice a year, one I think in January, another one in the summer. A um, hundred guests sign up. It's like 200 to 250 per guest. You have to have an adult to come with you. But we set up a bunch of different activities that focused on documents from the National Archives. Um, specifically this year was about uh, Meriwether Lewis, Sally Ride, and underwater exploration. So it was kind of a, a random collection of different things. But then we set up different uh, games. We actually have a design team at the archives that helps you make board games. So the interns made a shipwreck board game with a bunch of different documents that we tried to find that took forever, but we found them. And um, so we put that together and then they print it out and make a whole big board game so then the kids can go through the documents and look around. Um, I was doing social media that night, so I was lucky enough not to be stationed at one station. I could just walk around. So I did a lot of running up in all the different staircases and everything, but I got to see everything that was going on. It was really fun. They had some dress up stations and uh, a couple uh, music musicians, the Hildebrands, came and they taught everyone to dance from the Lewis and Clark era. And then, so they did that, and then they had um, Charlie Brown in Space, or it's something like that title. They played that before everyone went to bed, and then uh, everyone else sat up in their rotunda and they got to sit down, and then they turned the lights off and then lock everybody in, and then I left. So <laughs> that was that. No, I, they put like covers over it, so it's kind of misleading when they say you're going to sleep next to it because you don't actually know if the documents are underneath or not. So our supervisor refused to tell us because we asked her or not, but the secret is still semi-secret. Mm -hmm. But, yes. Any other questions? No? Thank you. And um, Holly, I, I actually um, didn't mention, um, is one of those rare accomplished sophomores um, who got this fellowship at the end of her, of her sophomore year. So it's, um, for those of you who are thinking of applying, it's actually open to students from all years. We don't, um, it would be very uncommon to be awarded to a first year student, but it also is, as, as you'll see, um, available to seniors who have just graduated. It's also available to international students. We had our first international student um, recipient Aldo Pontaroso, who will be presenting his um, via Skype or via um, tape, I guess. Um, so um, we have our next presenter, who is a who is a long distance presenter via video, Robbie Teal, who's a recent graduate from the class of '15, a history major from Waterloo, New York, small town in upstate New York. And for the summer, um, he actually lived in the big city for the first time, the big city of Philadelphia, PA, very historic city. Um, it happens also to be, to be my hometown. And it was really funny because in early July, I went and spent an afternoon with Robbie in, in Philly. He'd been there for about six weeks at that point. And I kept asking Robbie, I was like, oh, so Robbie, you know, while you're in Philly, you should go and check out. And he's like, oh yeah, I've been there already. <laughs> oh, well, if you like that, you should also go and check out. Oh yeah, I was there last weekend. Um, I swear, he knew Philly after six weeks better than I knew it after growing up there for 18 years. Um, I mean, he really had just kind of fallen in love with the city. He's um, talking about going back and um, trying to go to grad school there. It was just great to see him really engaging with the history and culture and cityscape of this, of this great place. Um, he worked at the American Philosophical <laughs> Society for the summer, as you will hear. And um, he is now working, actually, for the City Year program 
in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, which is, as you may know, a, um, an education program, sort of a, a, almost like a teacher core program for, uh, for the year after college. So um, he will talk about his experience. It's, I think, an eight minute video. Great. Hi, my name is Robbie Teal. I'm a proud alum of the class of 2015. And unfortunately, I can't make it tonight to give this presentation in person as I am in Milwaukee, where I am now working. And I'd like to take this time before I get into my little spiel to talk about, um, sorry, to thank everybody who helped give me this amazing opportunity and who helped make this possible for me to do this, not just once, but two times. So I really appreciate that and thank you very much. So this past summer I served at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which I might refer to as the EPS, um, just because it's shorter and easier to say. And when I was there I worked as a digital archivist, working on preserving materials and conserving them digitally for the next millennia, essentially. Um, and to make them more readily accessible for research purposes. The APS is, is and was founded as a library and a place of higher learning. Um, when I say philosophy, people often think of lofty thoughts, um, sort of abstract lofty thoughts. But in this case, it actually meant the philosophical sciences, which at that time would have been the natural sciences, um, biology, the hard sciences, um, and uh, social sciences as well to a degree. Uh, when it was founded. So that's really what our collection is about. A lot of early American history is there. Um, since Washington DC wasn't really around until the early 1800s, Philadelphia was the capital and of course as the capital it was the repository for all of America's most important documents. So here we have Jefferson's papers, we have an original copy of the Declaration of Independence and the only one on vellum. Um, we have Benjamin Franklin's papers. Uh, we have the entire Lewis and Clark collection and their journals and maps. Uh, we have Benjamin Rush's writings. So we have a great collection and I was able to work on a small piece of that. My major project was, as I said, to digitize things and to make it more readily accessible, but I also helped create computer programs uh, for educational purposes to be used mostly in middle school, so we could adapt it to be for a higher or lower level audience. And I also did some personal research as well, or personal in the sense that I was working on a project that they assigned me, but kind of at my own pace, um, which I thought was really fascinating. So my major project was the Henry Howard Houston II papers. Um, Henry Howard Houston is from a, or was from a local prominent Philadelphian family. His grandfather and father helped develop what is Chestnut Hill, if you're familiar with the Philadelphia area. Um, they set that up. They were railroad and real estate magnates. And Henry joined the military in 1916 to participate in the punitive expedition against Pancho Villa um, along the Mexican border. Later on, he was involved in World War I, where he ultimately died at the age of 23 in France when he was killed by a shell uh, which burst near his car and entered the back of his skull. Um, he was an aerial observer in 1918, which is when he was killed, um, and in 1917, when he first went to France, he was a volunteer uh, with the ambulance services, which uh, was a major way the Americans contributed before our entry into the war in late 1917. And later on, or actually maybe during this video, I've sent a link to the website I created, the webpage I created, um, of the 3H2, which is what I call Henry Houston um, papers, and you'll be able to see what I was working on this summer. So it's pretty exciting. I have a, well, you'll see it. It's very interactive. Um, there's a map showing his travels, um, the photographs, everything we worked with was his writing or his family's writing. Uh, they saved everything so we have a very valuable collection that's sort of forgotten about and it was one of the first collections of 20th century history that the APS has ever put on their website.
which I thought was pretty exciting to be part of that whole movement. And then I also had a side project, or several side projects, but my favorite one was the, working with the 1916 New York City polio outbreak papers. Essentially in 1916, um, so right in the middle of what was the global First World War, but not yet really the U.S. Uh, wasn't really involved at that time. Um, there was a polio outbreak in New York City that actually spanned from New York all the way to Maine and then as far south as Washington, D.C., and as far west as uh, Ohio um, and West Virginia in certain instances, though they think they might be from a different strain of polio. Regardless, 9,000 people were affected, um, and there was a mad rush to find where the polio or originated from. Um, and they pinpointed to an Italian immigrant in Brooklyn, New York. Because of HIPAA regulations and because of the uh, racial language used to describe the new immigrants, um, especially the Italians and the Jewish immigrants who were in Brooklyn in 1916, we really didn't do too much with the digitizing, but we did a, a bit of a research paper, uh, a research project, I should say, that I was able to participate in and really come up with um, to talk about this uh, so that, that later on people could work from what we found and put together and make something greater. So I learned a bunch of new skills. Um, I learned computer coding to help make the website, which I thought was a very invaluable skill in this digital age. Um, Challenging at first, after a while I overcame that and quickly learned what I needed to do. I learned some basic conservation skills because everything I was working with is original documents, some of which are very rare, which again I think is a skill you don't just get every day, so it's, it was another incredible opportunity I got because of this internship, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and I really just love being there. I love the research, I love the history and culture of America's first learned society and our incredible collection. Um, I loved seeing just these incredibly rare documents and handling them and being able to go into this amazing vault that looks like the one you imagine in the movies. Um, so it was, it was a wonderful time. And this is going to be great for my future career because I want to get involved in non-traditional education, so that means like non-classroom teaching, where I'll be able to you know, do sort of what I was doing there, create programs to help teachers educate um, students about a particular subject. In this case, we were creating a database, working with other institutions in Philadelphia to create something called Before the Leaves Fall, uh, which is Philadelphia's contribution to World War I. So things like that, I'm really excited about um, getting involved with that down the road. And I've been given a lot of the skills I need to do that from the APS this summer. And I also enjoyed it because I have a bit of a family connection to Henry Houston. My great uncle was in the same unit as Houston was initially and was sent to France at the same time. Later on, they split ways when Henry became an aerial observer, but I think that was pretty cool. So thank you again uh, for this incredible opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to have this rather unorthodox presentation um, via video rather than in person. And I hope that you have a chance to see this brief slideshow I put together showing some of the things I did this summer as well as the APS. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, as Robbie said, this is the second time that he's held a Comedies Byte Fellowship. Um, we do allow people to apply a second time. Um, we ask that if students apply again, and also um, Jackie um, Petito, whom we'll be hearing from, is also a, a two-time recipient. Um, we do ask that if students apply a second time, that their um, second fellowship should not just repeat the first, but should build on it in some way. So last summer, Robbie worked at um, uh, Colonial at Historic Jamestown in Virginia, and he was really involved in some exhibition design in some um, tour design in really working in a place that's a very a very active visitation site. Um, so this summer he did something that was more archival, um, that was more scholarly. Um, that's an institution that, that caters um, somewhat more to specialists, but is also trying to sort of break out of out of its walls and uh, speak to the general public. Um, there's a there's a brand new director 
there at the society who actually started a month after Robbie did and um, he emailed me and Gene and said just how thrilled he and his staff were to have Robbie as part of the team. Um, their first Washington College um, worker or intern and they're looking forward to having more. So um, we hope that we'll be sending more people there in the future. Our next presenter is Anna Black and Anna is a member of the class of 16. She's a Hispanic studies and studio art major from just Hispanic studies, okay, Hispanic studies major, sorry, Anna, um, from right here in Chestertown, Maryland. And she worked in the publishing office at the Library of Congress for the summer. Welcome, Anna. I hope I'm not just a forehead. <laughs> um, hi, as Adam introduced me, I'm Anna Black. Um, I spent my summer at the Library of Congress. So the Library of Congress is located in Washington, D.C., um, on Capitol Hill, uh, between the United States Capitol and the United States Supreme Court. So it's a very exciting area to be in. Um, I need to collect myself. <laughs> um, the Library of Congress houses over 160 million print and non-print uh, resources. Um, this includes film, books, obviously, um, manuscript, um, sound recording, sheet music, photographs, and many, many more. Um, there are three buildings in the Washington area that belong to um, the Library of Congress, and there's actually a fourth site um, in Fort Meade, Maryland, because they had too many materials to have in just three buildings. So, um, I worked in the Library of Congress publishing office. So in addition to uh, housing the world's largest collection of books, the Library of Congress also publishes many of its own materials for public and academic use. Um, so the, the Library of Congress publishing office uh, actually acts sort of as a form of outreach to kind of inform the public of the materials that the library has to offer, um, as well as publishing um, materials that researchers can also use. So the project that I was working on, um, my, my supervisor, Peggy Wagner, is actually currently working on a, his, uh, an illustrated history of World War I and is also producing an exhibition to accompany the 100th anniversary of the First World War. Um, she um, is going to be using, for this project, she's collecting photographs, uh, primary sources, secondary sources, and print material. And knowing that I had a background in um, several languages, um, I speak Russian, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese, so she kind of catered to that. And um, my uh, project was to find as much information as I could about the American involvement in Russia and in Mexico between the years of 1916 and 1918. Uh, both of those countries were going through a revolution during this time, uh, so she was particularly interested in American aid. So I <laughs> grabbed my warmest sweater and chained myself to the tables in the refrigerator that is the manuscript division. It is extremely cold there during the summer, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I got the chance to read through the journals and diaries and um, different correspondences and newspaper clippings of various very interesting inter um, individuals. Um, of those individuals, several of them included uh, an American Red Cross nurse in Vladivostok, Russia, um, a former United States Assistant Secretary of State. Um, uh, who else was there? There was General John J. Pershing in Mexico and an American banker in St. Petersburg, which sounds kind of like a movie title. So um, actually, through this whole process, there were, I really, really learned the process of research and I learned how tedious it can be sometimes because there were days when I was reading someone's papers and it would be pages on pages. For instance, Eleanor Lord Prey, who was the American Red Cross nurse in Vladivostok for, for several years, actually. She would just write to her sister about this dress that she was making for her daughter Dorothy or the, her knitting circle, which devastatingly collapsed. So it, would, it, was, a, it was a very um, long process of finding the actual material that was really 
useful to what Peggy was looking for. Unfortunately for Miss Lord Prey, I did not find anything particularly of strong value in the years of 1916 to 18. So sometimes it doesn't work out, but a lot of the times I actually managed to find very, very valuable information to the book. Um, one collection that I found was um, the, the papers of Leighton W. Rogers, who was the American banker in St. Petersburg, who when I first found his collection, I thought would probably have no particular, I, I didn't think that Peggy would be particularly interested in what he was writing about because it was more of, it was more economically tied than anything in relation to American aid. But he actually ended up having the most Actually, the, the most information that I found for, um, for Miss Wagner was from this collection because he had this extensive uh, collection of photographs that were just astonishing. Um, so I was really excited about that. So throughout the summer, a lot of people asked me, what does this internship have to do with your academic interests and what kind of, uh, did this give you any ideas for your future? And um, as a Hispanic studies major, uh, I deal a lot with Latin American history and culture. And the thing about America is that it does not exist on its own. It relies a lot on the cooperation of many other countries, and it has since its first days as a nation. So I think it's important to not only consider this cooperation, but also to understand it from several other perspectives. Um, so the more we understand about one culture's history, the more we can understand about another if they have any kind of interaction. In terms of my future, um, for a long time I thought that a Hispanic studies major would only land me a, a job in teaching or in translation. And I never had a particularly strong interest in teaching, sorry dad, um, <laughs> but uh, translation has actually become a much more um, attractive and realistic option for me in the last several years. So. This, this, in, this internship actually kind of opened up a new, I guess, shed a kind of light on uh, my situation and showed me that I can really apply what I, the skills that I have to a number of different professions and it doesn't have to be exclusively translation. It can be um, like what I was doing here where my, it kind of supplemented what I was actually working on versus being what I actually was doing. So my, for instance, my language skills helped me to translate some things that were useful to Miss Wagner's book instead of that being my primary job and that's what I'm coming in to do every day, so. So um, in all, um, actually this, this image was one of my favorite that I found. Um, this was actually a, a, um, an illustrated recording of the Battle of San, uh, Santiago de Cuba. Um, which I thought was really interesting. I can't actually remember whose papers I found. I think that was John Callan O'Laughlin, who was the former Assistant Secretary of State, and he actually had a lot of correspondences with Theodore Roosevelt, who that I got to read too, which was really neat. Um, but in all, this this experience has been extremely. Um, it's been very informative and very engaging, and I had the chance to learn about some very interesting individuals. Um, I definitely improved my academic approach. And I had the chance to contribute a significant amount of research to one of the library's um, next big upcoming publications. So um, I thank everyone who has, um, who has helped me to get here and gave me this opportunity. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah, you, um, you posted on Facebook over the summer about that um, Pershing document. So it was incredibly cool. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what you found in the Pershing. Yeah, so actually, um, Pershing had a lot of um, papers that were. So, so for those of you who don't know, John, uh, General John J. Pershing was in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution chasing Pancho Villa. Um, so a lot of his papers were um, kind of had a, a lot of them were lists actually of the ones that I found. I actually spent the majority of my, sp my summer working on the Russia stuff. But um, a lot of those lists, the one that Adam is talking about actually, it was a schedule. So it was like 9.30 eat breakfast, you know, 10 o'clock attack the Mexicans. So it was a really interesting list. And um, uh, 
most of those actually were lists. And a lot of the time, the handwriting was really, really difficult to read because I was reading these people's journals. They were all handwritten, most of the time, probably at night, um, where there wasn't a whole lot of light. They were rushing. So it was a lot of shorthand, and very oftentimes they had just awful handwriting. So, um, but it was mostly lists like that that I found. Um, I'm trying to think of another interesting one that I found there from the Pershing papers. Um, there was actually an interesting, there was like a, a cipher disc in one of his notebooks that I guess it was, it was, I didn't actually understand what it was. It was, it was kind of like a way to write code or something, but it was really neat to see that because it was just, because it was in his, in the middle of his notebook. I was wondering who he was using it for, but, um, but that was the kind of stuff I was finding in the Pershing papers. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, like I said, this is the this is the I guess the plans for the Battle of Santiago de Cuba. Um, I actually, because this was um, this was actually a file from I think 19. And now I'm forgetting, and I'm gonna get yelled at by one of the history professors if I get this wrong. Um, <laughs> but I think this was later than uh, than the time period that I was working in, so I didn't get a chance to research it a whole lot, a whole lot more. Um, um, I just thought it was really, really neat, so I I I wanted to save it for my own records. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Exactly. It's a blueprint. Yes. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, well, I, my dad is Dr. Black, who's sitting right, sorry, I'm calling you out, um, who's sitting right there next to Professor Sorrentino, and um, my mother is Russian, um, and I grew up speaking fluently in the family. My father also speaks nearly flawless Russian. Um, uh, and then I started taking Spanish when I was in high school. Um, I, well, I started taking what I was in middle school, but I started taking it seriously when I was in high school. Um, and then I kind of pursued that, and I knew that I, that was what I wanted to study when I got to college. Um, and then I transferred here my sophomore year. Originally, I went to American University. Um, I transferred here, and they were offering Portuguese in the fall. And I really wanted to take it. I'd always been interested in... I, I didn't really know what, to, what it sounded like at that point, but I was really interested um, to find out. And so I decided to take it up, and actually it's probably, probably my, well, after English and Russian, it's probably my third strongest language. Um, I, I think I just, I don't know, I enjoy doing it, and it kind of comes to me, so I really, or that's why. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Okay, I'm going to save Adam a trip up here, because he's been running a lot. Um, the next, uh, our next speaker is Ellen from... Sorry, Famularo, is that right? <laughs> okay, um, she's of the class of 15. Um, she's a sociology and justice law major, um, and society major, sorry, from Hershey, Pennsylvania, and she worked at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Okay, hello, my name's Erin, like she said. Um, this summer, I braved the heat of Atlanta at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Um, I was a marketing and communications intern. Um, so the center really focuses on connecting the American civil rights movement with um, today's various global human rights movements. Um, we also try to empower each visitor to the center to take the protection of every human's rights personally. Um, so that requires us to give each individual who comes through our doors a very um, personal uh, experience. 
Um, so these pictures are all examples of ways we get our visitors to interact and to think about human rights and how that connects to civil rights in a very unique fashion. Um, one of our most popular is our um, lunch counter. And it's the first picture um, where you sit at this lunch counter and you get to experience the emotional, verbal, and physical um, trauma that a lot of civil rights activists went through when they um, uh, participated in sit-ins. So it's very powerful and it's one of the first experiences you have when you get in and so that it just sets the tone for everything you go through. Um, and then my favorite part is just the very beginning is the second picture. Um, segregation is was um, told to be a necessity because of the the differences that they perceived between two races were there weren't very many differences. So the wall um, on this portrays African American culture, and the other wall portrays. Um, Cult, the culture of white people in the United States during the 1960s. But when you look at the walls, um, you're looking at them separately. But when you lo look between them, they're more similar than they are different. And that was a very powerful thing to see um, because you see people with their families, you see people dancing, you see people eating dinner, um, all very similar. So people aren't as different as they wanted them to seem. And the last picture is in our human rights gallery. We have a lot of interactive tables, um, which teaches you about what are the human rights concerns today and how do they relate to the civil rights movement and how do we keep these things going and connected and contribute to the dialogue, which is another uh, big uh, goal of the center is to create a safe dialogue um, and a safe space for people to come together and contribute to these movements and how do we allow everybody's voices to be heard, which is oh, it's a very important part of what I did. Um, so my responsibility is I did a lot of social media. Um, I surprisingly spent a lot of time with graphic design. Um, I spent a lot of time writing letters to celebrities <laughs> and um, I helped out with events, press releases, website updates. Those are just a few, but in all of this I had to keep in mind how do I include as many voices as I can? How do I not exclude anyone? Um, and how do I really create a safe environment for people to bring forward their concerns um, and just contribute to the ongoing dialogue? Um, so social media, um, I was in charge of their Twitter, um, Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook posts. So um, Twitter, my first assignment when I got there was to compile a list of important dates. And so I ended up just making a whole calendar. So every day of the year, what important events happened during the civil rights movement and in human rights history. And how can I create parallels each day um, with the current events that are happening because everything is just so interconnected. Um, I created the Pinterest. Um, that was my first major project, which was really interesting. Um, and that's where I learned a lot about marketing. How do, I, how do I get the demographic that I need to come to the center using Pinterest? Who's using Pinterest? How do I, um, what kind of posts am I going to generate? So I ended up focusing on family reunions, which is a really interesting aspect of the center because um, every summer we get a lot of people coming into uh, the museum for their family reunions and there's always something really unique about each person's um, experience. For instance, one of the families we have, um, in our galleries we have, um, portraits of civil rights activists that have died um, during the movement. And there have been families who have seen like their grandchildren, their cousins on that wall. So it's a very moving um, experience. Um, graphic design seemed like kind of, st I stumbled onto graphic design by accident. It started when I um, was asked to edit this document and all of a sudden I, was tasked with creating an event guide um, to get people to come and use our event space for their activities. Um, I also create flyers uh, for, so this is our Grandparents Day flyer that's coming up, um, and the one on the left, or 
yeah. The one on the left is um, a flyer or an advertisement that I made. It's my first published advertisement that's going into a, a magazine, which is pretty exciting. Um, and a, one of my favorite parts of my job is I get to help with events. <clears throat> The first event that I helped out with was when the Anderson Monarchs came, which is pretty exciting. Um, there's Winnie Davis. She's an amazing 14-year-old. Um, then on the bottom left is um, Livio Mandela, which is one of my favorite um, one of my favorite speakers that we had come, and it really shows that. So the center is not really just a historical museum. It's showing how history progresses and the way that people are really moving these dialogues forward, like Louis Mandela, who's following in his grandfather's footsteps, Nelson Mandela, um, and him trying to create um, a world where everybody's human rights are respected. Um, and then we had on the top, that crowd of people is at our launch of our LGBT Institute. And we also um, just released our first LGBT rotating exhibit that will be going everywhere. And I actually had the privilege of editing that. Um, and that was one of the moments where I really got to use my sociology degree because I not only was editing it for grammar and spelling, I was editing it for um, how the creating a voice that's really inclusive. We're um, editing it for cultural biases and things of that nature. And the bottom is um, an event that kind of surprised me. Um, a great thing about my internship this summer was that um, I never knew what to expect when I walked into the office. So this was just last week and we heard a rumor that Janelle Monet was in town. So my coworker and I decided that we were going to go find her and bring her to the center <laughs> on a um, spontaneous trip. So we ended up finding Janelle Monet, and we ended up at a rally for uh, families whose um, families whose sons and daughters have um, died at the hands of police who have not been heard. So what I learned from this experience is I got to do a lot of hands-on graphic design work from scratch, which I had no idea that I, that's what I would be doing. Um, but I really learned a lot just from doing that. I also learned how to use social media for marketing and how I can use my sociology degree to create such an inclusive voice um, in these movements and dialogues that are so important today. any unpleasant experiences because while the center does <clears throat> try to be really inclusive and we I went to that rally um, we also try to be as neutral as we possibly can be um, because being inclusive also means that we have to be mindful of other people's opinions so that was unique to me because we are a civil rights museum but we have to stay relatively neutral and we were a meeting place for these conversations um, and we just aim to create a safe enough space where anybody can come, and we want to engage everyone. Um, so, um, no, I've had no unpleasant experiences that I can think of. 
No. Even when, um, when the Supreme Court ruled on the same-sex marriage case, we had a rally out in front and everything went really well. So I'm happy about that. So. So um, you're, you're uh, staying on for a little while, um, longer. I guess. You're, you're the person here who's um, how many flight experience is really, uh, really continue. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Oh, sure. Yeah, so I recently signed on to spend another six months at the center. Um, basically doing what I've been doing now, but um, adding on to my list of responsibilities. So I'll be more involved in media requests, giving tours, things like that. Um, a lot more graphic design work. <laughs> and I just, I've been having a lot of fun. I've been meeting um, like John Lewis. He's really involved with our um, museum, which is amazing. Uh, just another way that shows you that history is continues to roll on like it's just a part of moving history it's great um so yeah i'll be staying there for a while longer so i'm very thankful for this internship it's given me a lot of opportunities and i've met a lot of amazing people so okay, okay and next up we have jackie petito uh, she just graduated. She's an anthropology and art history double major, as, uh, as well as Courtney Walls, with um, MA, a degree in art and art history with a concentration in studio art from Miami, Florida, and they both worked at the National Portrait Gallery. So hi, that was a great introduction, Erin, thank you. <laughs> uh, we worked at the National Portrait Gallery this summer, as Erin said, and so here is the front, and you'll have seen this picture probably from Amanda's presentation, because the Smithsonian American Art Museum is in the same building. Um, so here's the front there, and then we also have a floor plan here, so you can actually see how inside things are divided. It can get a little confusing at times if you're wandering through, but. I'm going to take this. Okay, so as Jackie just mentioned, we both worked at the National Portrait Gallery this summer, um, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and the director of the museum, um, her name is Kim Sadget, and she's actually from Australia. Um, but I found her particularly awesome because she was this ultra feminist, like really powerful woman who was trying to bring a lot of diversity into the museum system. So she was just a really great person to get to meet. Um, and then, of course, our supervisor. He was a senior historian at the museum, and his name is David Ward, um, who unfortunately can't be here today because he's in London. Casual trip to <laughs> London. Awesome. But we'll be seeing him soon. Yeah, we get to see him next week because uh, he actually invited us to go to um, an Alexander Gardner show opening um, next Thursday. So we'll get to see him there. Yeah. All right. So. Here's an average day at the Portrait Gallery. We didn't work in the Portrait Gallery Museum building. We worked at the Victor Building, which it's at 9th and G. It's pretty much right across the street. And here's a picture of our cubicle, which we kind of decorated. We sat right next to each other. We worked on pretty, all of the same projects together. And so we would do research every day. We got to utilize things like the library, which was awesome and on site. And we also had access to interlibrary loan from different institutions. So that was pretty awesome. And we got to kind of explore what everybody had that way. We participated in gallery checks. So each of us had to do a gallery check, which basically we went into the gallery in the morning and we were able to clean the cases and do all that kind of stuff. But that was nice because before the museum opened, we were able to spend some more time with the artwork, which normally we weren't able to do because we didn't work on site. We also, we were able to go on some field trips with our supervisor, David, because he wanted us to see some different exhibitions that were going on, because that's really important for us. We were working on different developing exhibitions, and we did everything from writing labels, exhibition proposals, and just really compiling artworks from the their own personal collection. And as I said, we got to spend a lot of time in the library, which was awesome. There, we got to go in the stacks, and if we had any kind of questions about a certain artist that we couldn't find anything on, 
then we could just go downstairs, use our library card, and usually they had a file and we could just go through magazine clippings, any kind of maybe personal records that they had from them. And so it was a nice extra resource that we had aside from internet searching. So that was great. So we worked on a great deal of projects during our time at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, it sort of seemed like David was just throwing anything at us that he needed extra help on. Um, so I guess the biggest one that we worked on was the sweat of their face. Um, and this is gonna be a future exhibition at the museum. Um, and it's on American workers uh, beginning in when, like the 1800s or so. Um, which was really cool, we just split it up evenly. I worked on more of the contemporary um, and modern um, images, but it was cool because we got to do a lot of the research and learn a lot of different things um, about these artworks. So one of the things that I found really interesting, um, so there is this image, obviously everyone knows it, Rosie the Riveter. Um, it's actually called We Can Do It. Um, and I found some interesting research about it that it's actually not based on a character named Rosie and it's not based on a riveter. So it was just interesting getting to learn about that artwork and actually getting to teach David about that because he had no idea that that, that whole history behind the image. Um, it was actually based on this woman worker in Illinois somewhere in a factory. So just interesting stuff like that. Um, and we also worked on a 1968 project because um, so the museum opened up in 1968, so they're planning um, a 50-year um, show to kind of showcase this horrible year in American history, but also the greatness that came out of it. Um, and then these are a couple of the other smaller projects that we worked on, like the Mario Testino, who is a fashion photographer. They're maybe planning on having a show of his artwork. Um, we compiled some research on rock and roll um, musicians. Um, we got to... Um, find some art, different pieces of artwork that might be going up in the embassy, the American embassy in uh, Sweden. Um, and then we also found images for a professor at Gettysburg who, um, he just wanted some images that would go along with his coursework that he would be able to show people um, in his class. And then the America's presidents. We found quotations for that. Oh, right. That was a very yeah. small, brief project yeah. <laughs> where David wanted us to find quotations from um, American presidents. And I just want to note, we made David's Instagram page on the right here when we left. So this is all of the work that we had. So we thought it was funny. We kind of put his Instagram on blast there. But also something that was really cool about the work that we did this summer the Mario Testino research that we did, we did a lot of just background research on him and his artwork. And that was especially challenging for us, I think, because there, it, he's all over, he's a celebrity, and so a lot of the stuff that you're going to find online is like, in the magazines, he's out with Kate Moss, or you know what I mean? And it's, so it was cool for us to try to dig deeper and get past all of that and see actually his work as an art, which it's, it is recognized as, he has his own museum, so obviously it's recognized as art, but I think a lot of the time we see him as more of a pop cultural figure. So it was a nice dynamic that we worked on there. Also, the sweat of their face, like Courtney said, I worked on the earlier half. She worked on the more contemporary part, and I thought that was cool because it combines our interests. I'm more of the historical, like I have an art history background and I'm into kind of older history and Courtney's very contemporary. So it really fit us well, the work that we did. Although we were doing the same work, it was very different at the same time, but yeah. So now we're on to interning with the Smithsonian. So as Adam said, I did an internship last summer with the Star Center. And so last summer I was at the National Constitution Center and this summer I was with the Smithsonian, and while I enjoyed both experiences, you'll see that Courtney and I made this staff picture. We're in, <laughs> we're in the eye. It was pretty hot, and it took a really long time, but we found the picture, so we, we had to put it up. But that was on the National Mall. That was at our staff picnic, which was also like the, the Folk Life Festival, yeah, and it was Peruvian-themed this year, and so we got to hang out down there and take the day off work, so that was cool. We also did things like a resume workshop, which was really beneficial to us because we needed to, especially trying to find jobs nowadays, we needed to kind of revamp our resumes. And so we went to a resume workshop at the Office of Advancement, I believe. 
-hmm. And so we got a lot of awesome tips there, which we then used at the career fair, which held uh, a lot of, it was at the American Indian Museum. And there were a ton of different institutions there. And it was nice to just be able to, in a small group kind of network and see what everybody else is doing and meet a lot of the different interns. So that was really cool. We also had lunch with Kim Say at the director. And there were a ton of different interns at the portrait gallery. And we had a, a group meet, I, it's called. I was calling it meet up for a really long time because I just had no idea what it was. But uh, so we were able to kind of get to know them. And then at the lunch, we all were together with Kim. And we got to ask her some questions. And it was really nice to have her one on one because she's very busy. And we often weren't working closely with her. We were working with our supervisors, and so to have everybody there and kind of get to know what a museum director does, especially at the Smithsonian, was really cool. Like I said before, we went on field trips, but not only with our supervisor, we also went on field trips with the other interns. So we went to the Capitol building one day, which kind of turned into a Library of Congress visit. We also went to the Phillips Collection. So. What was really cool is that we got to see a lot of DC and we got to do a lot of different things while we were at work. And not, our supervisor was really big on not only giving us the experience in the office, but also out of the office and to see different things that other museums are doing and how things are so that we could think more critically about how, what we're doing. And again, that library card was cool because we could go to any of the libraries. So if we needed a book, you know, we could take a field trip to the American Hershorn. History Museum or the Hershorn and get the book that we needed to complete our research. So here's a page of what it meant to us. I'll pass this to Courtney. Also the Instagram page. So as you can probably tell, we became very close with our supervisor, David. Um, he sort of became like a father figure and a mentor to us. Um, we brought him desserts on the last day because he meant a great deal to us. Um, he really pushed us and he didn't really hold back his opinions. You know, we would take up our writing samples to him and he would be very honest. And we were so appreciative of that because that's what it is like out in the real world. Um, they're not, they're not going to be like sugarcoating everything. So it was just awesome that he was very honest and supportive at the same time. Um, and this image was taken, that was on our last day. So sad. But as I said, we get to see him again next week. Um, but more personally, I guess, this internship um, was just a really awesome experience. Um, a lot of great things have come out of it. Um, before, I worked here um, at the Cole Gallery here on campus, and I thought that I just wanted to do gallery work for the rest of my life. Um, so this was my first experience in a museum. And I really enjoyed it, and I think I might want to go on um, to do museum or curatorial studies and become more involved with the museum system. Um, and at the career fair, I actually um, went to the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden um, booth, and I signed up, and I gave them my um, resume and a cover letter and an application to join their museum guide program. So that is now what I'm doing. Um, tomorrow, actually, I get to give my first tour at the Hirschhorn on the Sharin Nishat show. Um, so I'm really excited about that. So hopefully I'll be working for the Smithsonian for the rest of my life. <laughs> also, sorry to awkwardly interrupt the, the clap. Um, <laughs> so for me, this was cool because it was my second Comet Juice Fight internship, which I'm extremely thankful for. And I was able to, the first time, explore Philadelphia at the Constitution Center. And now I was able to explore DC at the Portrait Gallery. And there were very different experiences. At the Constitution Center, we didn't have a large personal collection uh, of artifacts. So a lot of what I did was kind of looking outwards, trying to find some things that we could put together for our own purposes. And at the Portrait Gallery, we have an enormous collection. And so a lot of what Courtney and I did, we searched TMS, which was I'm sure some of you use TMS, and it's kind of challenging because it's a one-size-fits-all system. And so it was cool to kind of put that out there and kind of explore TMS and see everything that we have because we have a ton of different stuff. And in the 1968 exhibit, we were even able to pick out our own images. David was like, yeah, just, you know, like 30 images of what should go in this exhibition. And we're like, okay. So <laughs> then we went on TMS. And it was cool to be able to actually pick and choose and see what we thought would work if, you know, we had tons of pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. as he was assassinated that year. And so 
it, which one would we choose? We had to really think about that critically and say, you know, how do we want this to come across? And it was a lot of not only compiling historical facts and also design elements. And I think at the Constitution Center versus the Portrait Gallery, it was different too because the different labels that I was writing. Here at the Portrait Gallery, it was 150 word limit and at the Constitution Center, it was 50 word limit. And so my editing was a bit different. There were things that I should include because you know of the artistic element of a lot of the things that I was writing about here today. So yeah, that's what it meant to me. Any questions for us? Also, I'm gonna just reiterate again, thank you for the experience. I don't know if I've said enough, but it was amazing. Do you want to go, Courtney? Sure. Um, so that's short for the museum system, and it's a way to sort of catalog all of the artwork that we have in our collection. Um, it is so huge that I don't even think everything's cataloged in there. But um, it's an online database, and we can actually access other museums' um, databases and collections through that system. Um, so it's a great way to find images that are in our collection and then also from other museums if we want to loan um, anything for future exhibitions. So it's just basically a search engine sort of thing. It's, it's just called the museum system. I think a lot of different museums use it, but I think we only had access to Smithsonian collections through our database, that, the way that they had it set up. Yeah. So. And that's, that's why it was kind of hard to use because a lot of different institutions do use it. And so for us, a big thing is the constituent of, since we're the portrait gallery, so that's gonna be a field that we're gonna fill in a lot. Some other places, if we do search by constituent, they might not even fill that field in. And so it's kind of, you have to know how to kind of search different yeah. things and just play around with it a lot because everybody kind of fills out those fields a little bit differently. And so that was definitely a learning experience for us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so, no. right? No, because they're, so they're images that you can easily find online. Um, he just sort of wanted the best of the best sort of images that we had to represent those people. Um, and there are some people that we didn't really have a lot of images or even no images of. So he, I guess he was just, his goal was just to see if we had the best images. But we're, I mean, it's a Smithsonian. It's a public institute. You can search the library. If you wanted to, as a just a regular citizen of the United States, you can go to any Smithsonian library and search their collection. So, no, there's no charge whatsoever. <laughs> so, before we close, there's actually kind of a quick, funny, now it can be told secret about Jackie and Courtney's summer internship, um, which is that when the faculty selection committee met last spring to choose among our applicants, we ended up with these two incredible applicants, Jackie and Courtney, um, who just seemed to be perfect for the National Portrait Gallery. But we had arranged with David Ward, the senior historian, for one Washington College intern. And we went around the room and around the room and around the room, and finally we said, they're both so awesome, we can't possibly decide. Um, and so we sent an email to David Ward saying, we've got these two fantastic students. We can't decide. You can pick which one of them you want. And he looked at them. He said, oh, my God, they're both so awesome. Is there any chance that I could take both of them? And we're like, yes, that's exactly what we wanted to happen. <laughs> um, so uh, they did both go work for him. And um, he emailed on their last day when they, I think it was before he, the, you guys brought the, the cookies, actually. <laughs> And he just loved working with you guys so much. And I think, you know, would love to keep you at the, at the Smithsonian and um, is definitely welcome, ready to welcome more Washington College students back. So um, again, please let us know if you're interested. Um, also in the Star Center's other programs, we're having a cookout for students down at the Custom House on Monday the 14th at five o'clock. Um, let us know if you're interested in attending that. Also to find out more about the other stuff we're doing this semester. Um, we have got our next event tomorrow evening in Hinson Lounge, a presentation by our Patrick Henry visiting 
fellow Benjamin Irvin. Um, we have got on the 17th our next um, group of Comagee's Bite fellows presenting right here, same time, same place. Um, lots going on this semester, and um, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to all. Oh, Michael Buckley wants to say. That's right, yeah, Eleanor Harvey, the curator at the Smithsonian American um, Art Museum who worked with Amanda for the summer will be talking about that upcoming exhibition with some other Humboldt um, experts here at uh, Washington College. So we look forward to great things in the semester ahead. Congratulations again to all of our Comagees Bite fellows and thanks. Thank you.